mark and moved and grew to New York, uh, where uh, Kiowa is, is headquartered in New York, although we spent time going back and forth to the other offices. And actually, they're opening a new office in London, which are coming up actually. I don't think I let anything out of the bag. I think that's, that's, that's well, well known happening. Uh, the, it was a, there was kind of an interesting timing actually of this, of this lecture. I, I started uh, trying to get this put together several years ago, or a year and a half ago or so, and, and, uh, but the timing is, is perfect actually. I, I'm not gonna go through and list you know, all of the, the resume background. Uh, hopefully you've read all of that and know from all that information, but one of the key aspects of it is, is Kyobe as a graduate of, of Vir University of Virginia, I'm a graduate of Iowa State University, and we're going to beat them on Friday. We <laughs> 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 got two grads out there. Woo! You've got a lot of UVA fans. We've got a lot of UVA fans. We have to make a little side bet on that before the That's so funny. Gladly. <laughs> Word, I, I think in describing you know, the big firm is, is innovative. You know, they 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 always challenge the conventional wisdom, but making looking deeper and, and trying to see where where the unique aspects of the project might be from otherwise very common you know projects. So um, they they create an identity. You know, a lot of projects that maybe normally might not have had that critical identity. They've certainly received awards, all kind of critical awards at the highest level, um, and it was a, just a tremendous success. I mean, they're kind of the kind of the firm of the moment, uh, and it was, which has been kind of building though over the last last decade or, or so. Uh, now I know I first became aware of them you know, from a TED Talks lecture, and I had no awareness, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I was tuned in and, and tried to find out as much you know, much about the firm as I possibly could, and and be stimulated and learn, learn by them. I, I'm not gonna you know, preempt uh, you know, Kaiowe's lecture and talk about the projects themselves, but um, there is kind of a unique story, a, a bit of a unique story, and it, it's about how our profession of architecture is, is, is really small and intimate. I mean, you know, we see this as global, a global environment, but the interrelationship, we're really a relatively small profession. Oh, and, and the interrelationship is strong. And, and to, to tell that story, uh, in fall of 2014, uh, I was giving a lecture at the AIA in, in Colorado, as was Kaiwe, and so I had a chance to, to meet him. Developed a conversation, one of the first, first parts of the conversation was he was in Des Moines working in a, in a competition you know, to do the come and go, the new come and go project. So I mean, the first connection was, was was in Des Moines after we meet in Colorado, and he's coming from New York, and I'm coming from Iowa. And then we uh, we talked more, and and I and this is part of the story I couldn't tell him, but I was I was chairing the National AI Honor Awards Committee that year, and we had just met as a committee, and one of the Danish uh, Maritime Museum, one of Big's projects, was a finalist, you know, for for the AI Awards, but I couldn't tell him because it. You have to, the unique thing about that project or that, um, that award, which is kind of the gold standard of awards programs, is you actually have to go visit every project that's going to get an award. And so that visit had yet to be made and the final decision had yet to be made. So I was fortunate to get to, to go to Denmark and, and get view the project and uh, came back and reported on it. It received unanimous you know, approval by the committee and, and then I had the extremely good fortune of informing the, the firm after the fact, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that, they, that they had been selected and uh, would be receiving a national AI honor award, you know, for that project. So it was, you know, it was my great pleasure, you know, to inform the firm of that award. And tonight it is my great pleasure, you know, to introduce Coyote Bergman uh, of Big Architects. Please join me in a warm Iowa welcome. All right, so are you guys here for the Hanson $2,000 award? Or are you actually here to hear about Big's work? I can't tell. Um, 
Well, uh, I have been given uh, the honor to uh, sort of talk about uh, the award. I think it's actually, um, I don't know too many schools that offer this kind of an award sort of halfway through or just beginning your architectural studies. Most schools offer awards kind of at your fourth year or your sort of graduate level, a traveling scholarship here or kind of a best thesis project there. So I think it's, uh, it's looking for kind of the emerging talent in the school. And we certainly had five projects uh, that we reviewed today that uh, I think say that uh, there's a lot of great stuff happening here in the school. So I'd like to take you through the five uh, folks that we uh, presented. I'm not going to remember everybody's name, so uh, I apologize about that. And uh, I'm going to start with um, looking at a kayak club or sort of a kayak and bicycle, uh, more of an infrastructure project in Des Moines sort of uh, between the 6th and 7th bridge, depending on how you're looking at the river. Um, and I think it's really important to actually expand your own definition of architecture to include infrastructure, because this is usually the realm of engineers, and there's a lot of money in it. So why not sort of expand yourself to actually include pseudo bridges and, and uh, flooding uh, resilient structures of actually thinking about how to, uh, to get involved in that too. The second project that was reviewed was the Algae House or an Algae Research Center. And this was really a way of kind of, uh, there's a creek that runs through uh, this part of, uh, of the campus. It's just outside basically, just a few uh, uh, hundred thousand feet away from here. And it was a, a chance to actually engage with uh, a new type of technology uh, to use it both as a sun shading device and as an energy source so that as the temperatures rise, as the sun shines on this facade, the algae grows and then shades the light that comes in. Um, then we moved into uh, another part of, uh, of the nearby in, in the campus where we looked at a kind of, um, a, uh, I think it's a facility that looks at kind of both the, the flora, the fauna that's uh, inside a forest, looking at both the kind of birthing of, uh, of uh, flora and fauna, but also the decay. Uh, also what happens to things as they sort of de decompose and go back. So it was kind of a, an educational uh, center uh, deep in the forest. Um, then we move to uh, another part. So these, all of these projects sort of show how architecture, landscape, uh, through a pavilion type of structure can actually uh, help to, uh, to combine those worlds. And uh, here we had a, another sort of interpretive center, a place that you could actually go and, uh, and, uh, and meet um, and engage with, uh, with the environment around you. And uh, finally, a uh, really interesting idea that uh, this, this landscape, which is now sort of prairie uh, grass, uh, would actually originally have been kind of marshy, swampy uh, land, and that as soon as the sort of prairie grass uh, either burns away or uh, would, would return back to that kind of marshy landscape. So it's an interpretive center uh, that looks at the different um, qualities of marsh. Uh, if there uh, could be such a thing, but yes, there is. And uh, the winner of the 2016 Richard Hansen Award is big. No, um, I thought I would take uh, $2,000 home. Uh, I thought you guys wouldn't mind. No, nah. the winner, the, the winner is the single winner because I know in years past, this has been a, an award that has been split between different teams, is Daniel and Joe's Algae House. Why don't you guys stand up right here? So, um, all right. All right, that was fun. Um, no worries. Uh, maybe we get the lights, if we can uh, dim that to that uh, level that we had 
sort of agreed on. That's beautiful. Um, I would like to take you on a journey of um, seeing how big works, both in terms of the processes of how we work, but also in terms of how the climate and the place, the siting uh, of our projects actually influences the way that they're designed. It's actually very similar to the five projects that I just showed you, how landscape, site, and buildings are actually intricately interwoven. And, um, you know, Big, or Bjork Ingels Group, as uh, Cal mentioned, is a kind of a couple of uh, places right now, Copenhagen, New York, and uh, soon to be uh, London. We work in a very open space, meaning that there are no corner offices. There's no, it's, it's really sort of, we look for factory spaces almost to kind of inhabit. Uh, Bjork has got his back to us. Uh, he walks around with his laptop and goes sort of from team to team. Uh, that's his office space. Um, and that's how sort of we engage and, and work together. Um, we recently had an exhibition, uh, a publication called Hot to Cold, and it takes 60 of our projects and arranges them from the hottest regions of the world that we work in to the coldest. At the moment, we're working in over 20 countries. We have construction projects in 11 of those, and we can sort of see how these different climactic regions uh, influence the way that we work. Uh, so basically, let's take that journey. I'm going to show you probably about uh, 20 uh, different projects of those 60 projects that are in the, uh, in the book. And if I were to kind of place big and our work uh, in sort of uh, into the sort of 20, 20th century, 21st century sort of polemic, on the one side, on your left, you have modernism. And in modernism and in the international style, you basically built a a building, sort of in this case, a very efficient glass skyscraper, steel, reinforced concrete, and you build these independent of where they're built. They look the same. You can place this in Santiago, Chile, in Dubai, uh, UAE, in, uh, in Philadelphia, right here in, in uh, Des Moines, you have the same type of building. And that's because you're allowing machines inside to take care of the differences uh, of temperature, of moisture, of uh, the air quality, so that you can have human habitation no matter where you are in the world. And it's basically saying that this is sort of man in a way over nature. On, the, on your right hand side is vernacular architecture. Basically architecture without architects. And the reason that all of these buildings look different is because they perform differently. So an igloo in Greenland looks the way it does because it insulates and it keeps the heat inside. And that spherical shape is what actually is the, sh is the smallest surface area to the actual uh, space inside. When you look at uh, Sana'a um, in Yemen, you have these wind towers because they're actually looking for ways to bring the air through the chimney effect, through the building, passively, without any fans. And so it's really about how in these different climactic zones, the architecture starts to sort of look different and perform differently. Big is right in between the two. In one way, we have been schooled and brought up in the modernist era and with the sort of efficiencies and the structural grids of modernism, but we also want to be informed by vernacular architecture. We want to kind of find a way to bring both of these into what we feel is a stronger and a more hybrid type of architecture and more sensitive to the local uh, conditions. We call this engineering without engines. The, the, the means that you can actually passively move air. You can sort of think about how, uh, how uh, a facade can perform uh, differently. Um, and so let's take that tour and sort of see where we're gonna start. So you can just tell by the, by the frame of the, each slide where you are. Be basically, here we have an average temperature of 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we're, in, uh, we're in actually Qatar, in Doha, and this is a competition, it, it still has not been decided, for the Al Jazeera headquarters, basically the cable channel. Now, when you look at this, 
These, this is basically two high-rises with a drape uh, of uh, um, um, a sort of cementitious fiberboard in between the two buildings and then a bunch of TV studios underneath. And what we're trying to say here is that the, the high-rises in the Middle East should not look like the high-rises in the West. They should not look like the high-rises of the Southern Hemisphere. Basically, high-rises should adapt and uh, really look and perform based on uh, what conditions they have. So here we have two very sort of standard modernist slabs but by the act of draping that um, cable between the two, we create an, a shading uh, uh, device. We create a microclimate underneath that shading device. We create a wind tunnel effect between the way that the two towers are actually oriented so that we actually create a kind of an, a climate that's now conducive to actually being in one of the hottest regions of, uh, of the world. So, Basically, the, the, the streets are also dictating the orientation of those buildings. Uh, we take basically uh, a block, we pull it apart. You have all of the studios that are uh, populating underneath, and then you have the drape. Now, the drape uh, is nothing new. The, these kinds of structures have been built before. If any of you know Alvaro Siza's beautiful uh, Portuguese World Expo uh, project, you'll know that these kind of cables exist. So it's again a structural solution that has been performed before. It's nothing new. And we basically bolt these perforated cementitious fiberboards, the perforations of which are small at the base uh, where you have the uh, studios and you need to uh, worry about reflection. Um, in some cases there are no perforations. And then as you move up the building, the perforations grow larger and larger until they actually meet up with the facade of the building where they're so large you can actually see and have the view out of these glass uh, buildings. And, um, and then we also work uh, on uh, projecting imagery onto the facades as well. So this is a, a kind of a high-rise structure that you would find in the desert. It's designed for the desert. And uh, we're hoping to hear soon about the results of, of the competition and see if we can actually build uh, this in Doha. Um, we're going to move now to Miami. So still in a very tropical environment. Average temperature is 77. And these are two residential towers. Um, we, uh, we're in a part called uh, um, a, a, a Grove, the Coconut Grove. Uh, it's just uh, south of uh, Miami downtown. And the site there is very narrow, meaning you have a kind of a front tower condition towards the water and a back tower condition. And you can see that these pairings of towers have been built in other parts of Coconut Grove. And what happens is in the real estate mind of the purchaser, the front tower is better than the back tower. So the seller can uh, get more money for the front tower and gets less money for the back tower. We were wondering if we could actually start to play with this and we decided why not actually twist the tower so they look more side by side so that when you go into the back tower you have the same views, you have the same orientation and that you actually would be able to sell the back tower at the same price. So um, we made sure that everybody had the views, we made sure that we looked for kind of uh, floor optimization, everything uh, is actually connected with a really lush landscape and we're talking about 12 foot floor to ceiling heights uh, where the columns kind of move up with the structure. Uh, the core stays uh, stable so it's always of course the the shaft of the elevator and the these columns almost become like family members because you know you sort of identify with and sort of uh, 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 sort of become uh, it becomes a part of your um, of your um, uh, of your apartment. The other thing, if you think about South Beach and the Mi Miami vernacular, then what you have often are these kind of eyebrows or cantilevers. And that again is providing yourself sun shading. So we've taken this to also a, a sort of nth degree where we run that cantilever all the way around to a wraparound terrace. So you literally can walk around your apartment on the outside. 
you can open up those uh, sliding glass doors with your fingertip and sort of really meld inside and outside, and those overhangs provide the sort of passive shading. Um, and then you have the, the sort of landscape that uh, is really lush. So the question that we were often posed just a year or two ago when we arrived in New York, it is, you know, is the thinking that we have and that we've applied to different countries, is it possible right here in the United States? And for us, the answer is yes. Um, so you know, these are being completed. Uh, they are to finish this summer. Um, and the client has definitely been able to recoup the cost of the twist and then some. So it also uh, shows itself as, uh, as being able to be uh, uh, profitable for them. Uh, back to Asia, we are now uh, in, um, in Taiwan, and this is on the east coast. It's a town called Hualien, and it's basically known as a, a kind of place that you go to retire. Um, and so these are what we would call empty nesters, folks whose children have moved out of their apartments, they're downsizing, and they're also a little wary of uh, their health and wanting to be close to health facilities. So we've designed a, uh, a, a sort of a very large residential development in three phases where you have a hospital, you have um, sort of uh, uh, furnished apartments, you have uh, apartments that have uh, uh, assistance, assisted care living, and its huge emphasis is on sort of uh, active design, like moving and becoming active uh, and providing a lot of social spaces where people can get together. So the apartments are smaller, but then they have also a lot of social spaces where they can get together. And uh, you would say that the buildings look different, but they aren't really because everything's built on a grid. And if you think about your house, you know, a house has a pitched roof and all we've done here is take the pitched roof all the way to the ground. And so it's, it's uh, in many ways uh, a, a very t typical type of construction. Uh, we have green roofs so that we can um, basically uh, harvest all of the rain, uh, ra rainwater and, uh, and whatever hits hard surfaces is used for irrigation. A and that, that creates kind of, a, a, again, a microclimate just within the project of kind of an evaporative cooling. So it's always a few degrees cooler uh, in, this, uh, in this structure than uh, if you are just next to or down the street from the, from the project. So um, here you have these kind of social areas that are happening on the ground floor. Uh, there's again this desire to sort of have inside outside relationships because the, the weather is so temperate and um, looking for ways to uh, provide running paths both uh, above ground and below ground when it rains. Uh, using the, the, the rainwater that hits hard surfaces into irrigation ponds that are then used to, uh, to water everything. And uh, the question is, you know, can this be built even in Asia? And the answer is, this is the sales pavilion that was just finished, completed, it's not a rendering. So it's, it's basically testing out the, uh, the, the green roof technology and making sure that uh, as we move into phase one, all the kinks are kind of worked out. So uh, we're hoping that phase one, uh, which is about a third of the project, uh, starts construction uh, this summer. Um, staying in Asia, we're now in Shenzhen. Shenzhen is the third largest city right now in China and growing uh, very quickly. If you look at just the region of Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, it's well over 100 million people. Uh, it's really one of the first mega cities. And um, we uh, won a competition to do our first high rise and it's for the energy company. Now in America, an energy company is very likely a publicly traded company and it is then beholden to its shareholders and those shareholders wanna see higher and higher returns. The only way to do that is to of course sell more of your product, so more energy, more plugs, more appliances, more you know, stuff. In Asia, they realize at this very moment, they cannot keep up with demand. The energy companies cannot build power plants fast enough to actually 
go with that kind of growth. So the energy company here has the opposite uh, 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 mission. It is to reduce the amount of energy that their buildings use. So the tender for this project was, please reduce our energy use by 30%. And if you do that, and it's a nice design, we'll take you. So uh, the way that we looked at it and approached it was, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of 200, it's right in the center of the city, that's the convention center, and it's a 220 meter and 110 meter tall tower. Uh, the energy company would take this and then lease this smaller one out. And uh, if you notice, it's got sort of a jagged uh, facade. And we have opaque elements and we have clear elements. So basically the opaque elements, when the, when the sun is coming from the south, the hardest sun, it never makes it into the, into the building. Because really, in glass skyscrapers, that's what you have to basically fight, is that in the glass skyscraper, the sun moves into the building, heats up, and then you're sort of busy cooling it down. That's what you use your energy for, especially in a tropical environment. So here, we don't let the harsh sun in. We still provide the views out towards the northern uh, uh, orientation. And when you're sitting inside the building, you're basically looking at a series of sort of bamboo uh, veneered fins. And then when you look north, you have the sort of uh, views that you have out. Now, we also provide kind of uh, spaces where everybody can come together. That's, of course, the, the entrance lobby. Uh, then there's a, a meeting room uh, a level where we kind of pull out the facade. Uh, you can see that up there. So we have a canteen and a meeting room. So there you can enjoy larger views out into the city. Um, and it's sort of pulling back where, where you need to enter into the building and provide those views. Um, so very happy to say that this is under construction. Uh, the facade elements are going up now. And uh, it's looking at sort of a completion of uh, early to mid-17. Um, and we proved that uh, through energy modeling that we were able to reduce their, their energy footprint. So suddenly the energy company is actually the greenest uh, 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 client in all of Shenzhen. And they hope by showing this through their efforts that other companies will also uh, become more cognizant of their, of their resources. Um, we're now in Korea where it's, I can't read that, it says, uh, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're you know, in orange. Now, what you notice in the hotter climates or the warmer climates is that um, the facades are critical because again, it's all about the sun, the solar uh, uh, radiation, and kind of how you deal with it. So the most important thing that you can do when you build in any climate is the siting of your building. How is your building positioned on the land? The next thing you need to think about is where does the sun move? And then how are you going to deal with the sun outside the building, within the facade, or inside the building? And uh, when you start to make those decisions, that's how you can sort of see how your design is already influenced. Now, when we looked at this, this is a kind of a basic office building. It couldn't be any more basic. And it's for a, a Korean a solar uh, manufacturer, a uh, PV manufacturer, ph photovoltaic. So we have a bunch of photovoltaics on the roof, as you see. Hanwha is the company. Now, one thing that we are testing is that you can sit there and accept everything that you read in catalogs and all the manufacturers sort of provide you. Or you can force or you can ask, you can inspire those same manufacturers to think of something else. Because if you think of like the louvers, louvers have been used since the dawn of time. But louvers recently have only come in kind of two orientations, horizontal and vertical. Now, when you put vertical and horizontal louvers around a building, they're only working at about 60 to 70% efficiency. Because the sun moves and it's not vertical or horizontal that actually will keep the sun out. So what we've done is we've looked at basically the shape of our building. In this case, you know, whether it's a square or a circle. And then we have uh, done a, a map of the sun across that surface. 
We have then looked at the optimum kind of orientation of louver to surface area. And then we have determined whether it's horizontal, vertical, or a variation thereof, a diagonal, that would actually provide you with the best solar. So now it's working at around 90 to 95% efficiency. And it's almost like a fingerprint because you could take any square or any building, place it on a map, and that, radiate, that radiation uh, imprint is going to be different for every location on the planet. So no two buildings are alike. And we're basically asking these louver manufacturers to use new technology, new tools, to now extrude different shapes that we can assemble uh, to create these, uh, these sort of more efficient facades. And we have about three projects that are kind of looking at this uh, at, the, at the present time. Um, one of the projects that I'm uh, involved with is the Big U. And the Big U is, um, is something that I think a lot of cities have to deal with in the future as well, which is resiliency. And uh, you all remember Superstorm Sandy came. There's a new neighborhood called Sopo, south of power. Uh, I lived there. Uh, I worked there. Um, it wasn't fun. $20 billion of damage. And what I think is incredible is that the Obama administration in Washington, D.C., they asked designers, they asked architects to form teams to not only put band-aids on things that were broken, but to think proactively on how we could actually design our cities to be prepared for the next storm. And there was $1 billion that was made available by HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department, to actually ask international teams to come up with ideas. There was no brief, there was no project. The only project that was given to you was all sandy affected areas were your site. You come up with the solution. You come up with everything. You tell us what to do. So 140 teams tried out. 10 teams were then selected to do ideas. And six teams were then able to split the $1 billion to then invest in, different, in six different environments. And we were uh, working with all of Manhattan, all of Manhattan that was uh, basically hit by Sandy. And when you look at the areas that flooded, what's really remarkable, everything kind of in blue flooded, is that the areas that didn't flood were the Manhattan of 1650. So everything since 1650 has actually been infilled by, by, by humankind. And you know, Canal Street is named that because it used to be a canal. Uh, water Street is named that because it used to be the water, not four blocks away from the water. And so all the areas of flooded were the areas that uh, basically the water went back all the way to its natural habitat. And again, that's something that you can see in any city, Boston, uh, to, uh, I know that there was a huge flood here, I guess, in Des Moines in the 50s, and that changed a lot of like, people's view of the river and how to, how to work on the river and how to live on the river. So these things are important. And I think that, again, we can leave these things to engineers to figure out, and if, if that's the case, go to New Orleans, see what the Corps of Engineers did. They put up a 15-foot brick wall that runs, it's a levee, it runs through the center of the city, and it's right next to where people live, their houses look at a concrete wall. And the water is just on the other side. So kind of like no aesthetics, no understanding of like how we as humans interact with the water. We have to of course be wary and be careful, but we also don't want to design something that I think when you consider it's only used like 0.01% of the time, it needs to protect you from floods, 99.98% you know, of the time, it it's, could be something else. And with that in mind, we designed uh, basically a, um, a protective system that is really a park. Because you can use the park 99.98% of the time, but then that same park also protects you when the, when the floods rise. So what we discovered in the areas that flooded were these little pinch points and what we then decided was to build a protective system 
that basically was made up of uh, uh, sort of phased systems or smaller systems that all link together. So this is the big U right here, which is made up of little U's uh, that are more tailored to the different neighborhoods that they serve. And uh, you know, what, the, what does that mean? Well, it means that you know, it's not a wall, it's a piece of furniture. So it's a bench, it's a kiosk, it's a, it's a theater. So all of these things are the same wall that you have in New Orleans, except it's active. It can be used. And so we also looked at how that kind of stretches through the parkland. And really, it's a lot like the High Line, where you have a decommissioned railroad, and you place a park on top. And I'm hoping that some of you guys and many of you guys have seen the High Line. We are creating the Dry Line, basically a park that keeps you dry. And so it's an infrastructure project right here that keeps you dry. At the same time, it's seating for the tennis, or it's another stadium seating for the baseball. And this is what it looks like today. So all of this area was flooded during Sandy, and now it would be entirely protected uh, by this berm. And uh, this is not something that just happens. You don't just do it on the back of an envelope. This is through hundreds of meetings, through speaking to 27 governmental agencies, having them all kind of go in the direction that you would like for them to go. So it's an enormous, I would say, kind of social uh, uh, investment in seeing and, and how the local people can actually become involved and empower them to actually uh, support design. Here is the, uh, the idea under the FDR. These are clapped down sort of uh, um, to protect you against the rising sea levels. In the winter, they can be used partially to create like uh, holiday markets. And in the summertime, they're lit, so they provide a safe place to walk uh, when, when you're uh, there. And so here's the berm on the right. There's a, now a bicycle path that goes the entire length of Manhattan. So you literally are able to bike for 10 miles without crossing a single street. Um, and this is actually happening. We have gotten now uh, um, um, another uh, $550 million of uh, investment. So the first seven miles of the 10 miles is actually going to be built. It's pretty remarkable. Um, this is the, uh, up, this is the uh, reverse aquarium. So you come here to actually see where the different uh, uh, flood levels have been. A little bit like your parents used to sort of in a doorway measure how uh, tall you were. So it kind of, the other thing that's really important is to educate the public about why you need this. Why do you invest in this? So um, that's uh, our hope sort of on a city scale uh, to talk about how design and architects can make a difference. In New York, we're designing this um, West 57th project. It's right here on the edge. And it's the idea of just how Central Park is like the, is like the, the, the park for the entire city. We're now looking at like the, the bringing Central Park inside a building. So uh, this is kind of our design process. When I look around your studio, I see the same kind of you know, iterative uh, uh, model making. And the idea here is, you know, New York is all about skyscrapers. And Europe, Copenhagen, where we come from, it's all about courtyards. So when you marry a skyscraper with a courtyard, you get a court scraper. And uh, this is kind of like a, a new typology uh, for living. Uh, and we're kind of reintroducing the courtyard into the New York uh, skyline. So here's your city, whole city block. The one thing that we do is that we raise the courtyard one level, so there's a whole floor uh, retail at the podium. That's really important in New York. But then we just sort of pick up the, uh, the corner, 37 stories high, and we have 710 apartments. And then the other thing it does is that it's a good neighbor because all of 80%, 90% of the views of this building are all maintained. So it's also thinking about the buildings that are actually around it. The better neighbor you are to the people around you, the more supportive they're going to be to get your building built. Because you could build a tower right here and all of those folks would lose their, their view. Um, so this has uh, been going, this is our first project in America. Uh, it's uh, been uh, on the boards for about uh, uh, six years. Um, we also are doing the interiors. In America, often they tell you you can only do the outside or you can only do the inside. And it's such crap. Uh, 
you are able to do really everything or whatever you want to do because you know design is design you can design a piece of furniture you can design a lamp um, it's really up to you so we had to actually we were designing the outside of the building and then the client had asked us to compete again for the inside of the building. So uh, we went up against the big names of New York and we won on a concept called Scand American. Uh, Scandinavian design with American comfort. Uh, think of a lazy boy that looks good. Uh, so uh, that's very hard, I know. But that's uh, basically what we're, we're doing a lot of like uh, uh, natural woods, birch, uh, you walk up the stair and then you have the courtyard uh, from your unit. You can look across the courtyard out to uh, New Jersey. Remember, I told you that the full floor at the base is uh, retail. And then it has lots of different silhouettes. So wherever you look at this building from, you get very, very different uh, uh, sort of uh, qualities. And then this is the uh, West Side Highway, which has a park that runs along the riverfront. And it's almost as if the park kind of hopped the street and is now inside the, the building. But uh, this is what it looks like today. It's going to open next month. 20% uh, of the apartments are affordable. And what that means is you can live in a two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan for $550 a month. So uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um, that you, uh, <laughs> some of you might be paying more here in uh, Ames, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, it's our responsibility as architects to build for everybody, not just the one percenters. I think that, that oftentimes the outside world uh, only looks at us as the kind of elite profession uh, that only a few people can afford. I think it's really important that you uh, design and, and sort of bring your skill set to, to a, larger, uh, a larger populace. And um, what I'd like to do now is to sort of give the word over to Bjarke to kind of explain another project called the Vancouver House. The Flatiron in downtown Manhattan is an architecture born out of a specific moment in New York real estate history where skyrocketing land value intersected with the advent of steel structure and elevators and transformed a difficult triangular site into one of the most striking landmarks in New York, becoming the namesake for its entire neighborhood. And for us at BIG, this is a perfect example of how we like to work. We like our designs to respond to their surroundings. We like them to inherit their attributes from the challenges and the potentials of their environments. Like for instance, this court scraper uh, in Manhattan that combines a courtyard with the density of a skyscraper, creating a wall pyramid uh, on the waterfront of the city. So essentially, our buildings end up looking different purely because they perform differently. Take, for instance, this financial center in Tianjin that inherits its stalagmite silhouette from the structural challenges of building taller than half a kilometer. Or this observation tower in Phoenix that allows the visitors to experience a three-dimensional, 360-degree panorama of the surrounding city, almost like a heavenly body hovering above the desert. And finally, that brings us to Vancouver. The first time I arrived in Vancouver, I drove across the Granville Bridge, and I was struck by the beauty of the urban panorama of the slender glass towers rising against a backdrop of the sea and the mountains. And right here where Granville Bridge trifolks, we've been invited to reimagine the gateway to the city. This is already a, a site in transformation. Granville Bridge is being transformed into this pedestrian parkway, almost like a Canadian cousin to the High Line in New York. And right where this new green promenade touches downtown, it's gonna create a new urban oasis, which is gonna become our new neighborhood. So first of all, we, we thought, why don't we reimagine the traditional urban podium and turn it into a lively village full of alleyways and plazas for like a, a dense, lively urban environment of like restaurants and retail underneath a green carpet of grassy roofs and under the canopy of the bridges. And for the tower, there's a general 30 meter setback requirement from all the bridges to ensure that nobody lives too close to the bridge reducing our tower to this like tall, slender triangle. 
but also to respect the neighboring park, we had to sort of recede our silhouette to ensure that they get daylight and sunshine, reducing our footprint to only 600 square meters. But then we were thinking, if the 30 meter setback has to do with ensuring a minimum distance, as soon as we rise above and beyond the bridges, we can actually come back out and maximize the areas with the greatest views and the most abundant sunlight. So it almost becomes like this tower turned upside down that actually grows out of a tight spot in a lively city and then expands to occupy the maximum area uh, in the surrounding skyline. In a way, you can see Vancouver House as a contemporary Canadian evolution of the flat iron that takes the residential high-rise one step further into the future. So basically, you start to see how both the zoning challenges, the sort of uh, the site challenges of working in a city, um, the climactic challenges of actually if you're working in the tropics or if you don't, um, that you, know, you see how these are sort of impacting the design. Remember I said that in the hottest climates, the facade is really where you start to sort of see uh, the maximum kind of potential uh, to you know, deal with, uh, with the heat and, and, and the whole uh, climactic envelope. When the, uh, when the temperatures get more mild, like right now in Vancouver, then other things take over, like program or like zoning. So then those are the sort of predominant forces that actually start to, uh, uh, to impact your designs. When we get back into the colder climates, you have to stay warm. And so again, that moves out into the facade and how you actually deal with the facade is about how you, uh, you start to sort of uh, think about the projects. So this is now in Copenhagen. Uh, this is a project that Cal actually mentioned, the Danish Maritime Museum. And you, know, you may be thinking that we're doing a lot of new construction, but we actually do quite a lot of work also in existing structures. So this is an old abandoned dry dock in, uh, in Denmark that for centuries is where they built the, you know, the most ships in Denmark. And it was a place right next to Hamlet's Castle right here. Uh, so this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, this is uh, the, the, you know, everything is rotten in the state of Denmark. That's uh, happened right here. And uh, all of these former dry docks where all the shipping was built is completely gone. Thousands of jobs have been lost and uh, the entire industrial sort of center has been ripped out. And so that just was bas basically derelict, like so many industrial uh, sort of artifacts that all of our cities have abandoned warehouses and so forth. So what the city decided to do was to restructure this and to invest into a cultural zone. So we now have the Maritime Museum here, we have a theater here, we have public art, we have all kinds of kind of cultural events that are occurring. The landscape also was invested in and now everything is sort of uh, working together to create a new heart for this, uh, for this town. And um, when the Danish Maritime Museum was to move into the dry dock, uh, the brief said, uh, pump out the water, stick the museum into the hole and cover it. That's what we want. And so six architects were uh, asked to uh, compete for this. And uh, we looked at this and we were like, how sad that the very artifact of the shipbuilding era, which was the dry dock, would be lost you would not be able to actually take it in as a space. And so we decided to actually bury or, or even further our excavation and then place the program of the museum around the dry dock, leaving the dry dock as a public space. And we felt that that was actually the best part of the entire exhibition. And uh, the, uh, we were awarded the competition. This is our biggest project to date. We were just, uh, you know, basically two, three years old. Not me personally, but the company. And uh, we had just won the biggest cultural project in Denmark, and the other five architects sued the client, saying that if the brief had told them <laughs> to put the museum around the dry dock, they would have done the same thing. And, uh, Wow, 
the uh, client annulled the competition and said, we're not going to award anybody uh, the, 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 the win. We were devastated. About a week later, the client comes into our office and says, we have a new type of project we'd like you to investigate. It's to build a museum around the dry dock. <laughs> and uh, we hope that you can help us uh, realize this vision. So you have to also have clients with cojones uh, that uh, think as creatively as you do in seeing how to actually get the job. Um, it's really a two-way street. These things are really, really difficult uh, in many ways. So uh, we played, th these are benches and seats right here. They're long benches and little seats. And you can see like, you know, it's, it's all underground. So a car could easily drive in. So we were asked to put up these benches and seats to kind of protect cars from driving in. But we also took it as an advantage to do Morse code. And it says basically the Danish Maritime Museum. So uh, kind of, Playing with Google Earth and, you know, who, we, we, don't, we don't tell anybody this, but if there's like some maritime, you know, nut that's like looking at the Google Earth and it's like, Eureka, you know, uh, <laughs> they kind of get it. And uh, you sort of pop in uh, into the museum uh, through this entrance. You then basically are walking on the outside of, uh, or, you know, basically on the opposite side of this wall. We built some bridges to create some shortcuts. Uh, and we, there are beautiful, lots of spaces that Cal can also sort of uh, really talk about. There's spaces for kids that only kids can kind of creep into. Um, and uh, there's also the whole heritage of the museum uh, told in a, in a very beautiful way. And then the, you can go into the dry dock without ever paying the entrance ticket. So they have public theater, they play Shakespeare in the park kind of thing. And it's really that space that we always envisioned for it to be. Uh, to uh, give it back to the city. And this is the reverse Titanic moment right here, uh, <laughs> looking, into the, looking into the hole. Now, um, you've got to tell them that there's no flat floors in the entire building. No, no, there's no flat floors because uh, we basically uh, like the Guggenheim, uh, which is that spiral that takes you down or up, depending on which way you go. Uh, this is a continuous sloping uh, uh, floor because by the end of going around that dry dock, we want you to be one floor below. But also it's to give you that kind of queasy, like never, uh, you know, when you're on a boat, you're never quite straight. So it has both, uh, both effects. And um, this is a lesson in that you never know where your next job is gonna come from. This is Bjarke's math teacher in high school. And Bjarke's math teacher, now sort of 20 years forward, uh, is now the principal of the school and uh, they need a new multi-purpose room like a sports room and calls up his al uh, alumni uh, alma mater uh, Bjarke can you come in and uh, help us design this Bjarke comes in and he goes geez this is the first project we then built a second project because the first one they liked so much but the first one we did and uh, it was you know how do we build a uh, multi-purpose hall on a campus uh, where there was no space to build anything. So we built it in the courtyard, which is a big no-no. I mean, courtyards are, are, are uh, you know, they're important and they're sacred. So, uh, but, so we submerged the building underground and we did a slight bump. And to appease his math teacher, to, to show him that he actually taught, learned something, uh, <laughs> This is the ballistic arch uh, equation of throwing a handball. Handball is the national sport of Denmark. Uh, and that is actually the curve of the ceiling. Um, you all have heard form follows function. This is form follows formula. Um, and uh, the, needless to say, the, it tickled the uh, math teacher pink. And uh, we got the job. And then this is the bump in the uh, school. This is the underside of all of these glue lamb beams. You can see the natural light pouring sort of on the edge. Uh, then we got the second commission to design some classrooms, uh, whereas the, um, the, uh, the first project is uh, concrete walls and a wood ceiling. Uh, the new one is a concrete ceiling and wood walls. And then you pop out of the uh, new space uh, onto these uh, uh, soccer fields. And here you can see the bump right there. This is the entrance into the bump 
and then this is what takes you over to the soccer fields. But what's really nice is that, you know, the bump is, and, and the, the courtyard is used so lovingly now, and during graduation, the parents say it's the first time they've ever been able to see every child uh, sort of graduating, uh, because before it was all sitting on like a flat uh, courtyard. So everybody's uh, uh, really, really happy. And it's also to show that, you know, on the smallest budgets, you can do amazing things. Uh, notice that there are no light bollards, there are no lampposts. The furniture itself is the light uh, source. We had a lighting budget of 35,000 euro, which is like 50,000 bucks, and we uh, lit the entire uh, uh, space all from these uh, seating elements. So they do dual purpose. Um, and so there's opportunities everywhere to uh, bring that design touch. We're now in Arctic climates, blue frame. Uh, this is a ski resort up in Lapland that you take the elevator up and ski down the roof of the hotel. So it's, uh, this is a 1960s ski resort. This is our addition. Um, and um, it's sort of four buildings where the fourth building comes up and, and, and connects to and matches the uh, old building. One of the worst things about skiing is carrying your skis, like being on a flat surface. So we literally regrade the entire top of the hill so that there is always a 5% slope. You can basically board or ski in and out uh, now. And uh, we basically take the number of rooms that they needed um, and uh, create kind of a village uh, feel by having these four pedals. And then each one is uh, able to be sort of uh, uh, skied down as a, uh, as a kind of uh, extra little feature. Um, also, it's green grass roofs, so in the summertime it blends in. Even though it's a large building, a large structure, it was really important for the rest of the community that it didn't look completely like a mammoth on top of the mountain. So um, this is currently undergoing city approvals, and we're hoping for a building start in the, uh, in the fall. Um, sort of sticking in, uh, in uh, the north, this is our power plant for, we call it the powder plant, uh, because it has a ski slope on top of it. Um, again, the realm of infrastructure. Power plants are not what architects do. We're, we're usually never invited to these things. But here, Denmark is a little different, and they decided we want a good-looking power plant. So um, this is going to be uh, Denmark's largest building and tallest building. So we decided if it's the tallest building in the flattest country, uh, that is actually in a Scandinavian climate, so four months of the year, it, there's snow on the ground, then like, why don't we actually take advantage of that? So uh, here is the power, power plant. The other name we have for it is called white trash. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, waste, basically household waste from all of these folks goes into this plant, and then uh, heat and electricity for, uh, for all of the residents in uh, Copenhagen comes out. Basically one ton of trash is equal to one and two thirds uh, barrel of oil. Um, and then you know, we, we graft a ski slope sort of on top of it and create this kind of recreational uh, 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 space. Because you know, no one wants to live next to a power plant. You, you have a lot of NIMBYs, not in my backyards. And what we're trying to do is to sort of turn that on its head and basically create YIMBYs. Yes, I want a ski slope in my backyard. And to sort of turn the tables of what is typically seen as not a, an amenity for the city. But in the future, you'll be able to ski down on real snow for those months in the winter, but it's a synthetic mat, so you can actually ski down it all year round. And then you'll have hiking trails, you'll have a, a world's tallest mountain climbing wall, uh, you'll be able to bring your kids, bring your dates, look at the uh, skyline, and uh, it's really sort of going to be a destination. Um, the inside, we put super graphics on all of, the, uh, all, all of the instruments, so you can actually see how waste is turned into fuel. Um, and it's going to have this kind of Willy Wonka-esque kind of uh, walkway. Uh, you'll be able to go down with models. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good sailing feature when you uh, have good-looking people in your renders. Um, and uh, believe it or not, we actually have this as a project. This is getting built. It's going to be there in 2018. Uh, remarkable. Um, these things happen. 
America, uh, well, Denmark, 54% of its waste is burned and turned into electricity. 44% is recycled, and basically 4% goes into landfill. America, 1% gets recycled, and 99% goes into landfills. And then we talk about energy independence when the very energy that we could use, uh, we bury uh, underground. So maybe in future generations, they'll be smart enough to know that a fresh kills dump is actually a, uh, a, a fuel. Um, maybe one day we will. But other countries, tiny little countries like Denmark, already see the future and are acting on it. Now, one of the things that we are doing also is blowing out smoke rings. Because when you think of a normal uh, factory or a plant, power plant, it just has this trail of smoke that you have no relationship to. You don't know how bad it is. You don't know how much it is. It just comes out. Our intention is that the only way we as humans change our habits is through information. And so what we're trying to do is provide you with the information so that you can change your habits. Every smoke ring is, equates to one ton of carbon. So when you have your daughter out there, you say, look, dear, three tons of carbon have just been burned in that plant. And then when you bring her there maybe a year or two later and there's 20 rings, well, you know, maybe we're screwing ourselves and maybe you'll change your habits so that those rings will diminish and become less. So it's like when you hear the clock tower ring three, you know it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. And the same way in the, now with the smoke rings, you're gonna be able to tell uh, how much is actually burned. And as architects, you don't go out and buy smoke ring generators. They don't exist. So what we do in our office, we have something called Big Ideas. It's a bunch of architects, nerdy engineers, uh, wonderful uh, human beings who literally do the tests and create the prototypes of these types of things for us. So we've, we've paid on, out of our own pocket for the first two prototypes, and then maybe some of you saw a Kickstarter campaign that funded the third prototype, and now we're working on the fourth, which we think is the final one before it'll actually be built and put into place. But here is a little video that shows you how you create a smoke ring generator. So I hope that uh, you've seen uh, us making our dreams come true, and I hope that you'll make your dreams come true in the future. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, so I think one thing that makes things work so exciting is that you sort of respond to challenges uh, in a way that's both deeply humanistic, but you're also you're taking risks. Um, and I think that as a profession, architecture has kind of shied away from taking risks. But we do talk a lot about our social responsibility. And I wonder if, uh, I guess, if Big sort of believes that part of our social responsibility is taking risks, right, is sort of building the future that way. Well, I mean, I think, up, yeah. Uh, how, is it, how is it navigating different cultures? With sure. So you've hit it right on the, the nail on the head because it all does come down to risk. And the construction industry is one of the most risk averse industries because I think of the amount of money that we are actually talking about your house that you would purchase, or your, uh, if you build a building, uh, may be one of the largest investments or things you would ever do in your lifetime, right? So, um, and this aversion to risk makes everyone go to the safest option, but not necessarily may it be the smartest option. It's just the safest. 
Now let us take another industry, right? Let's go to technology. Let's go to software. How is it that in the software industry, they can actually send out a product that they know is not yet perfect? It's got bugs. They use every single one of you to figure out what the bugs are. And they send out patches every week or every month that fix the patches. Imagine building a building that has bugs, which are called holes, and it leaks. And every week you send out a patch to you know, fix one of those holes. We can't do that, right? That, like legally, uh, uh, insurance wise, can't do that. But we have got to find a way to allow for risk to kind of come back into the building and the design industry. And another, like one of our clients is Google. And I find Google to be incredibly inspiring because uh, you know, they, they say something they, they call moonshots, where you know, for them driverless technology was a moonshot. Uh, Wi-Fi for everyone on blimps around the world is a moonshot. Um, they literally think big, pun intended, uh, to literally figure out ways for us to kind of leapfrog and not take baby steps. And I think that, that we can learn a lot from different industries about how to finance risk, how to um, collectively take risk, so it's not one person that's kind of like sticking their neck out. Um, I think government plays a huge role in type of risks. You know, it's remarkable that you can do 10 wonderful buildings for the, for the public sector. You create one dud, and that will be an albatross around your neck for the rest of your life. Like everyone will say, no, nope, they designed a building that didn't work. Even though you may have done a wonderful service for the public sector for decades, it's, it's this kind of like uh, need to uh, assign blame and assign uh, sort of uh, when things don't go good. I think what's wonderful in America is that failure is sometimes seen as good because you have tested everything and then you sort of take one step back uh, and you sort of like know not to sort of go over the cliff. Failure, I think in, <laughs> I don't know if this will ruin your careers or uh, whatever, but failure is good. <laughs> I said it. Uh, <laughs> failure is good because you have literally tried something. I mean, this is like intelligent failure. I'm not talking about stupid failure. <laughs> intelligent failure is like testing something, you know, that you are just kind of like testing, testing, and then once it doesn't work, you sort of take a step back. And I think that we need that in our, in our profession. And I, I would say seek out people who share that philosophy. Yes. So I would ask you to define it a little bit more. Do you think it's simple or simplistic? I think I can hear the question. Oh, the question was that uh, basically a lot of our work uh, is, seems to be done on uh, the fly. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but the, it's, it's very kind of uh, diagrammatic, maybe. Or, it's very easy to understand, like almost too easy to understand that the concepts are maybe, uh, I, I would say, does something have to be, is something good if you can't understand it? Like I, I don't know why the ability to communicate ideas generally to a broader audience than just architects sitting in a room is a bad quality. I think that the ability I think the ability to actually to, to bridge and to communicate the built environment to as many people as possible is actually really, really important. Because then you'll actually get them to support your ideas as well. Now, the, the, we use a lot of diagrams 
to break down very complex issues into sort of step-by-step -step, uh, uh, ideas and narratives. Now, we have been sort of, you know, people sort of say that that's very diagrammatic or very simplistic. I can assure you that there's nothing simplistic about actually doing these types of things. It's extremely complex. And uh, what we're just using the diagrams for is a communicative tool to reach people beyond the architectural community. And you can come into our work at any level and you can start to also engage with it at the you know, material level or at the, um, at the programmatic level, at the you know, technological level. And you would find, I think, a lot of different uh, layers to, to, and meat to actually uh, to, to work with. No, no. Um, the post-rationalization, I, I was confronted with that when I got like the Richard Meyer books in the 1980s and 90s, and he had these incredibly sim like simple diagrams of the parti, the datum, the hierarchy, uh, circulation, and I was always amazed because I got it. Like you look at those diagrams, you look at the picture, and it's like a clear arrow of connectivity. And I was always asking myself if those diagrams were the initial designs or if those were created after the house was done or the building. And I think we don't create those diagrams afterwards for a publication. Those are actually a part of our uh, creation, our, our concept generation, uh, because we have to kind of, the way, the way I think Bjarke would put it is that he has to understand it as clearly as the diagrams it communicated before he can actually go out and, and, get and provide the narrative and provide the, the story. And if you know Bjarke's in, a former company was called Plot, P-L-O-T. That was five years before Big. Now, w I would ask you, what does Plot mean? So Plot has a double meaning. Plot is, of course, a drawing that you plot on a plotter. Plot also is a narrative in a movie, cinema. So he was using this kind of double entendre of like the drawing of an architect and the narrative, the story that that drawing actually communicates. So it's, um, we call it iterative design or Darwinian, like, like evolutionary design. And just as you would in Darwin, uh, certain concepts have certain strengths and weaknesses, and we test them. So the, the concepts come from lots of different people. So if you're in the team, whether you're the project leader or the intern, you are generating ideas. And those ideas are continually tested then once we've internally tested it, we test it with our consultants and we test it with the client. So that goes through yet another filter, another kind of editing process. And then we find this, the strongest species of ideas and those are the ones that uh, then make it to the, to the final. There was one more, yeah? So this, the, the dry line's a great example. The city has never shared their conceptual ideas with the general public because they're afraid of them. They're afraid of actually saying, hey guys, here's something in process. Could you help us actually find out what's the best thing? Instead, they would keep it kind of like a poker player and keep it and show like maybe one thing that has the least amount of information on it. Keep it, keep it, keep it all the way to the end and then say, here's the idea. And then the public would be always very kind of like, well, we're not a part of this process, so why do we want to support it? And so when the, the dry line, it was the competition itself 
was done by the Rockefeller Foundation and not through the city government. And that's huge difference. The Rockefeller Foundation made us meet with a hundred, we had a hundred meetings with different stakeholders, the public. Sometimes meeting two or three times with the same folks over four months. And it was a hit. We got letters of support that were written to like the Obama administration from, you know, 30 different peoples, 30 different uh, groups. They had never seen that kind of support. So now the client is actually the city, the mayor's office. And they're being forced to do the same type of like very heavy, they call it now community engagement. Can you believe that our contract as architects for the Big U project is not designers? We're not, we're not, we're not hired as architects, we're not hired as designers. We're hired as community engagement officials. <laughs> and that's because the city has prescriptive things, that, like titles, and what we did didn't have a title yet. And so community engagement official existed, so that's what we are, but then we have broadened that to mean let's design stuff, let's present it, let's build models. They don't, they've never built models, physical models. Everything's always a rendering. We told them, but if people can actually see it, pick it up, start to move walls around, that's a good thing. And so it's, it's a very new process for the city of New York. Yes is more. Yes. yes. Um, and so well, I think that, that our profession, you are going to be confronted with so much negativity. Like, uh, honest to God, you will start 10 projects and you may get to build one of them. So you got nine people telling you no. Now, if you were a baseball player hitting 100, you would be on you know, some farm team or so, somewhere. You wouldn't be in the big leagues or the big show. So you have to deal with so much negativity, and that's what we do every single day. And how you maneuver, how you navigate, how you stay positive, how you, you know, that's basically what we do every day, is like take something, a challenge, a naysayer, someone that doesn't want something, and basically turn it around into something that actually, now that you, you mention it, I want that. And, uh, you know, the, the competition for the power plant did not say place a ski slope on top of it. No one's ever seen it before. The only ski slope that I know of uh, is in the, in the Middle East, Dubai, and that's the most unsustainable uh, structure on the planet, right? Uh, it's got penguins inside it. Uh, that just, that's a bad thing. Penguins in Dubai is, just shouldn't happen. And, uh, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like trying to figure out, like, I think how we as designers can put, like, don't stick with the status quo. Don't do the things that everybody has always done. Figure it out for yourself. That's, I think, what also the, the, the software engineers, the, the tech companies figure out, right? Like, there have been taxis around the world since there's been a horse and a buggy. And Uber comes along and completely disrupts the taxi world on a, on a simple thing, right? Like that a person who owns a car that it's sitting in their driveway, it's losing money. But that same person could use that car and earn money. And suddenly like, you know, you have hundreds of thousands of new taxi drivers pissing off all the taxi drivers, of course, around the world. But it's like, you know, you, you got to sit there and think about how to use your skill set to, to create those opportunities.
affordable. affordable. Yeah. It's a set deal before. 80-20 is like a normal uh, uh, going development kind of ratio in New York. And I think it's super important that in a place like Manhattan you have those guidelines that the government sets. Uh, the current mayor, Mayor de Blasio, wants to raise that to 70-30. So you know, then the developers have to see if they can actually make the, the finances work. But um, if you don't do that, you're going to quickly create kind of islands of haves and have-nots. And that's what I think is also important is that's, that's something that we as architects perhaps don't have so much power to influence. We can talk about it, but it's really a political kind of uh, testament. What are those ratios in uh, Denmark? Well, Denmark is interesting in that it, the government provides so much social housing uh, affordable housing. You, you can't actually equate the social housing in America with that in Denmark. It's like, it's, it's like, boof. it's like, it looks like market rate type of housing. Um, so there is no need of uh, creating those because there is such an oversupply. Uh, what has happened though is that um, through lower interest rates, uh, there's more home ownership and there hasn't been that much in Europe historically. Uh, it's been around 30 to 40 percent. Now it's ri rising. And that home ownership issue is creating kind of a little bit of a, of a tension uh, within, within uh, residential. Um, maybe two more questions, and then we'll, we'll call it a night because I'm, I'm drying out. So the question, if you heard it, is what do we do with ideas that didn't win competitions? And you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a really important question because we put so much you know, attention, love, and uh, idea creation into all, every single project. We call it evolutionary design for a reason. What we do in one competition can evolve into other projects. It's not a copy. It's an evolution, it's a growth. It might be a new site, it might be a new client, it'll grow, but we actually take the ideas that we generate and use them. And uh, I think that's a really important. Nope, you had your one question. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. And the, the what? Are looking for a building that? Are you, do you find that your clients expect something different when they come to you versus using another cut? Or do you find that some clients come to you because they're experts or something? I would hope that people come to BIG not to get something different, but to get something intelligent. And that that intelligence may make their buildings perform differently. Um, but my hope is that it's, you know, it's not about creating icons. It's about creating kind of a tailored solution to whatever the challenge is. And, uh, you know, we don't do only buildings. We do system, we, we've worked for Audi to create uh, uh, the future of transportation. Get this, so Audi selling cars, Cal, I love your car. Um, uh, Audi, uh, came to us and they said, we're worried. Uh, when architects show the future, then they only show bicycles and happy, smiling people. <laughs> there, are, there are no cars in the future. And this is scaring the automotive industry. This is scaring Porsche, VW, all of these guys. So they came to us and they said, please tell us, how do we get cars back into your renderings? And, uh, <laughs> We thought like, whoa, that's kind of like sick, you know, uh, but let's do it. So we went and we jumped on it and we then sort of analyzed, we researched them and analyzed them and then our first comment to them was, 
what are you, what are you, Audi? And they were like, we're an automotive company. And we said, no, you are a transportation company. And it could be on four wheels, four rings. It could be on two rings. It could be on 10 rings. You create an Audi experience traveling with a train, with a bike, with a motorcycle, with a, with a, a, a zip line. You're creating something that is so unique. And if you look at it that way, then go into all the different transportation systems and create that Audi experience. And it kind of like was like a, whoa, you know, like the world is now much bigger than just <laughs> selling four wheeled gas guzzling cars. And I think that that's the kind of thinking that, that someone like Audi is actually coming to us for. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>